Now, we were doing diamagnetism. Now, the most exotic diamagnetic material is a superconductor. So, superconductor is the most exotic <coughs> diamagnetic material. Why? Because it completely opposes whatever field you have. Okay? So, it, it totally opposes the external field field so that it totally opposes the, uh, the, the external field so that the field inside the superconductor, the field inside the superconductor, superconductor becomes zero, absolutely zero. Fine. So you have a, so you have a supercomputer, a superconductor, sorry, superconductor and you, you put it inside a, you put it inside a magnetic field, external magnetic field, it opposes you with equal magnitude so that, so that the field inside becomes absolutely zero. So what happens? The magnetic lines they come like that and they'll they'll absolutely miss the superconductor altogether and okay how does so, it help how does it help in what called superconductor but it conducts electricity no th th that's a that's a different thing but but you just oh, this is the magnetic property of it right what you are talking about is the electrical conductivity property of that okay there are, there are many other phenomena at work but somehow the moment you have a superconductor this the field inside is absolutely zero it totally opposes you so what does it mean it means that your your mu r is equal to zero is it not what will be mu r for a superconductor zero so what is your chi? Chi will be minus 1. Is it not? Mu r is 0 because B is equal to mu naught mu r h. H is not 0. Mu naught is not 0. So mu r will have to be 0. And since mu r is equal to, since mu r is equal to 1 plus chi, so 1 plus chi is 0. And hence chi is equal to minus 1. So that's why this. We understand that? Now, there is a... Uh, there's a phenomena of there's a phenomena of quantum locking okay that that is beyond the scope but i'd like you to know that keeps this magnet locked it gets locked Okay, I, I'll, I'll show you a video to actually, so that you appreciate that. Oh, this is a TED video. It's a TED video. And here it goes. Quantum limitation. And the object that was levitating here is called a superconductor. Superconductivity is a quantum state of the matter, and it occurs only below a certain critical temperature. Now, it's quite an old phenomenon. It was 
discovered 100 years ago. However, only recently due to several technological advancements, we are now able to demonstrate to you quantum levitation and quantum locking. So, a superconductor is defined by two, two properties. The first is zero electrical resistance, and the second is the expulsion of magnetic field from the interior of the superconductor. It sounds complicated, right? But what is electrical resistance? So, electricity is the flow of electrons inside the material. And these electrons, while flowing, they collide with the atoms. And in these collisions, they lose a certain amount of energy. And they dissipate this energy in the form of heat. And you know that fact. However, inside a superconductor, there are no collisions. So there is no energy dissipation. It's quite remarkable. Think about it. In classical physics, there is always some friction, some energy loss, but not here, because it is a quantum effect. But that's not all, because superconductors don't like magnetic fields. So a superconductor will try to expel magnetic fields from the inside. And it has the means to do that by circulating currents. Now, the combination of both effects, the expulsion of magnetic fields and zero electrical resistance, is exactly a superconductor. But the picture isn't always perfect, as we all know, and sometimes strands of magnetic field remain inside the superconductor. magnetic field inside the superconductor, they come in discrete quantities. Why? Because it is a quantum phenomenon. It's quantum physics. And it turns out that they behave like quantum particles. In this movie here, you can see how they flow one by one discreetly. This is, this is strands of magnetic field. These are not particles, but they behave like particles. So, this is why we call this effect quantum levitation and quantum locking. But what happens to the superconductor when we put it inside a magnetic field? Well, first there are strands of magnetic field left inside, but now the superconductor doesn't like them moving around because their movement dissipates energy, which breaks the superconductivity state. So what it actually does, it locks these strands which are called fluxons, and it locks these fluxons in place. And by doing that, what it actually does is locking itself in place. Why? Because any movement of the superconductor will change their place, will change their configuration. So we get quantum locking. And let me show you how this works. I have here a superconductor, which I wrapped up so it stay cold long enough. And when I place it on top of a regular magnet, it just stays locked in mid-air. Now, this is not just levitation, it's not just repulsion. I can rearrange the fluxons and it will be locked in this new configuration like this, or move it slightly to the right or to the left. So this is quantum locking, actually locking, three-dimensional locking of the superconductor. Now, of course, I can turn it upside down, and it will remain locked. Now, now that we understand that this levitation, so-called levitation, is actually locking, yeah, we understand that. <laughs> You won't be surprised to hear that if I take this circular magnet in which the magnetic field is the same all around, the superconductor will be able to freely rotate around the axis of the magnet. Why? Because as long as it rotates, the locking is maintained. You see, I can adjust and I can rotate 
the superconductor. We have frictionless motion. It is still levitating, but can move freely all around. So we have quantum locking, and we can levitate it on top of this magnet. But how many fluxons, how many magnetic strands are there in a single disk like this? Well, we can calculate it, and it turns out quite a lot. 100 billion strands of magnetic field inside this three inch disk. But that's not the amazing part yet, because there is something I haven't told you yet. And yeah, yeah, and the amazing part is that this superconductor that you see here is only half a micron thick. It's extremely thin. And this extremely thin layer is able to levitate more than 70,000 times its own weight. It's a remarkable effect. It's very strong. Now, I can extend this circular magnet and make whatever track I want. For example, I can make a large circular rail here. And when I place the superconducting disk, on top of this rail, it moves freely. <laughs> and again, that's not all. I can adjust its position like this and rotate, and it freely moves in this new position. And I can try, I can even try a new thing. Let's try it for the first time. I can take this disc and put it here. And while it stays here, don't move, I will try to rotate the track. And hopefully, if I did it correctly, it stays suspended. quantum locking, not levitation. Now, while I let it circulate for a little more, let me tell you a little bit about superconductors. Now, so we now know that we are able to transfer enormous amount of currents inside superconductors, so we can use them to produce strong magnetic fields such as needed in MRI machine, particle accelerators, and so on. But we can also store energy using superconductors because we have no dissipation. And we could also produce power cables to transfer enormous amount of current between power stations. Imagine you could back up a single power station with a single superconducting cable. But what is the future of quantum levitation and quantum locking? Well, let me answer this simple question by giving you an example. Imagine you would have a disk similar to the one I, sh I have here in my hand, three inch diameter, with a single difference. The superconducting layer, instead of being half a micron thin, being two millimeter thin, quite thin. This two millimeter thin superconducting layer could hold 1,000 kilograms, a small car in my hand. Amazing, thank you. So that's what it is capable of doing, right? And the magnetically levitated trains, they are actually built on that principle. What because was the strength of the magnetic field? Hmm? What was the strength of the no, magnetic what he said was one micron, two mm thick superconductor. No, that 
No, it was normal magnet, a normal magnetic track. Normal magnet. Mm -hmm. So it can be used in a lot of places. Huh? It is being used. Uh, the magnetic maglev trains that you call, they are actually using this phenomenon, <coughs> right? For moving at seven hundred, thousand, two thousand. Now they are planning a, a train at three thousand kmph. You know.